Well, hello everybody. I hope you are doing well. My name is Jody. I'm one of the associate pastors at Parkway United Methodist Church. And joining me today is my husband, Michael Chung. Ooh. So we are so glad you could be here with us on this weekend devotional. If you're here, please let us know by um, putting your name in the comments section below. Give us a wave. Even though we're not um, doing Facebook Live today, I will be interacting with you through the comment section. So let us know that you're here. And let us know your thoughts as we talk about this um, very important topic today, one that I feel like we can't ignore um, and we can't remain silent about. You know, we are living in an unprecedented time of national unrest. Never before in history have we experienced this magnitude of suffering and loss of lives caused by a viral pandemic overlapped with the pandemic of pain and anger sparked by the death of a black American man under the knee of a white American police officer during an arrest on Memorial Day. Now, whether or not you support the protesters, whether or not you believe there is a need for police reform, whether or not you think the media is fake or real, racism is real. You know, I am a Chinese American. My parents immigrated from Hong Kong. And growing up, I identified less with Chinese actually than with the white majority. I wanted to be like white people. I thought the most beautiful people in the world had blue eyes and blonde hair. And ashamedly, I would join in with my white friends and use the N-word and other names on the black kid in my class. He was the bad guy and we were the good guys. Well, in turn, he called me chink and other names and he would play pranks on me, like sneaking up behind me on the bus, pulling the brats out of my hair and throwing them out of the bus window. You know, simply by growing up in a middle-class suburban neighborhood, I have been influenced by the fact that whites hold social and institutional power over people of color and I wanted to be on their side. You know, the irony is looking back, the black kid and I were the only two persons of color in our homeroom class and we were attacking each other. You know, even if you are not a racist, racism exists in this world. Even if you've never experienced racism yourself, people today are still being judged by the color of their skin. Even if you think Mr. Floyd's death had nothing to do with racism. The church still has a responsibility to learn, to teach, and to engage in discussions on racism because racism is what's on our country's mind. And racism is hurting people. And above all, racism is contrary to the gospel. Mike? Racism is something that the Bible even talks about. It's no stranger to racism. In fact, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, was written about 3,500 years ago. In Genesis chapter 43, 32, we see that there's racism that occurs. Um, Joseph is now the second in command of Pharaoh. His brothers have come to Egypt to look for food, and they still don't know that the person they're dealing with is their long-lost brother Joseph. And while they're dining, Genesis 43, 32 reads, um, they served him by himself, that's Joseph, the brothers by themselves, Joseph's brothers, and then the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. And here's an interesting line. The Bible says, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. At the very heart of racism is an over-exaltation of one's own identity over the, the identity of a different group. This, is an in essence, is pride. The Bible certainly is no stranger to the idea of one group of people being better than another group. And we know it's wrong. The Egyptians later would perish at the hands of God over their belief of superiority. When God led his people out of Egypt, God would engulf their army, drowning them in the Red Sea, um, while Israel would travel um, to dry land. Nowhere in the Bible does God exalt one race over another. Despite Israel being God's chosen people, Paul writes in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, 
nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm. Because of Jesus' death on the cross, we are all equally saved by his blood and have great worth before God's eyes. Amen. And at the end of the Bible, God ends racism once and for all. In Revelation 5, 9 to 10, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, the angels sing a song in heaven, crushing these bonds of racism. And the song goes like this, Worthy are you to take the scroll, that's Jesus, to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on earth. You see, racism will someday end. God has ordained men and women from every tribe, tongue, people, and language to worship him around the throne of God in heaven. There is no mention of superiority. Even his chosen nation, Israel, is not singled out. All races, ethnicities, and people groups will have equal status and already have this equality in the heart and mind of God. Amen. That is such good news. And that is the kind of heart, this heart of God that I wish I had had most of my life. You know, personally, as well as many of us, I think, can I, if we really dug deep in our hearts, we have all um, had racist thoughts and attitudes that have been apart from what the Bible says, that have been contrary to the gospel. We have all looked down on people while elevating, um, looked down on others while elevating ourselves. And, you know, for me, I don't know about you, Mike, I... For me, you would think that I would know better um, as a Chinese American, um, given that I've experienced racist comments and actions myself. Uh, most recently, when the coronavirus was spiking in Houston and the city was under lockdown, um, I went out for a walk in a park. And I had a mask on, um, and I was keeping my distance, but I remember passing by um, this older Caucasian gentleman. You know, I was on the sidewalk, and he was on um, a park bench, a few feet back from the path and I thought okay this is fine so I was walking by him and we were probably at least four to six feet away but as I walked past him he got up from his bench and walked further back from me so I didn't think too much of it at that time I thought maybe he had to go um, throw something away but as I was circling around I noticed that he went and sat right back down and then just um, not even a minute later, another lady, a Caucasian woman, walked past him, and yet the man remained sitting, and he didn't get up to move away from her. And this was around the time our president kept calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus, and other incidents of attacks on Asians were happening. But, you know, even with that and the other racist comments that I've had throughout my life, Unlike my African-American friends, I can go running and not be afraid that I won't make it back home. I am not afraid that two white men will follow me and gun me down like they did Ahmaud Arbery. I can enter a high-end store in the Galleria and not feel like the store owners are suspecting me of theft. And I've never been really afraid of the police. I've never followed a set of hidden rules when it comes to interacting with law enforcement. Now, I believe churches, we believe churches and Christians have a responsibility to get educated about the history of racism and the systems that perpetuate inequality and prejudice today. We should not wait until it makes headlines or the news or becomes a movement to do this. Let us not see the work of racial justice and racial reconciliation as optional points of application but essential to our understanding of the gospel. You know, in closing, I just wanna kinda ask ourselves, what baby steps can Parkway take in keeping with our Methodist roots of fighting for social justice? What can our church do? I think first we can do the hard work of learning what it would take to be an anti-racist people of God, to deepen our understanding of the complex issue of racism you know, it's easier to say, yeah, I agree racism is bad than to actually become an anti-racist church. I think those are two very different things. We can listen to each other with humility and withholding judgment. We can listen to learn rather than to hear what we want to hear. We can seek out conversations with people of color. 
We can expose ourselves to cross-cultural dialogue. We can teach and preach on biblical justice. And finally, I think we can pray and ask God how Parkway can lead the way from protest to progress. Mm, amen. I don't think it could end with just peaceful protesting. I don't think we should wait until another tragedy like this hits the news. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we should um, be complacent. And, you know, again, I'm I'm preaching to myself here that I have been complacent. I have, I have books that I haven't read that I've committed to start and read. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to do this as one body, that we need to hold each other accountable um, to move forward and to see how we can make progress in this area and ultimately how we can be a more gospel-centered church of God. Thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you. Mike, would you just close us in sure. a word of prayer, a short yes. word of prayer? <laughs> Thank you, Father God, that heaven is a place that's all cultures, all peoples, all ethnicities. Help us be a reflection of that. Help us grow into the kind of people you want us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.